gonna give people another, you know, like 30 seconds or so to join. And while we're waiting, I'm gonna give a quick little disclaimer before we jump in. So this, um, this event today does pl take place outdoors. We're gonna be walking through this beautiful park. And because we're outdoors, that means we're also exposed to some of these elements um, that we experience outdoors in New York City. There may be helicopters flying above. There's a highway nearby. There may be sirens. So we might have occasional noise disruptions. If something excessively loud happens, I'm just gonna pause my talking so you guys don't miss anything. Um, and we'll just have a little awkward moment together while we wait for that to pass. Um, additionally, because we're outdoors, and outdoors is typically a place where people go to disconnect from technology. Um, you know, the, the internet connection may be a little unstable at certain points along our walk. So, um, so there may be times where it's loading or it says it's paused. I can assure you those moments will be very brief and it'll pick back up again pretty quickly. We, we did a trial, we already practiced this and we know that um, it's not gonna be a significant issue but it may happen a little bit. So just thank you for your patience with that. All right, so my name is Jennifer and I am the education manager at the Lower East Side Ecology Center. And our camera person, behind the scenes person, today is Antonio, our development oh. manager. Hi Antonio, <laughs> thanks for your help today. Um, so the Ecology Center is based right here at East River Park, um, which is such an amazing place to be, especially on a glorious day like today. Um, for those who don't know, we've been here at East River Park since 1998, but we've actually been serving the Lower East Side Ecology, or the Lower East Side neighborhood since 1987. We offer composting and e-waste services as well as stewardship and educational opportunities for New Yorkers who just want to understand their environment a little bit more and find ways to really take action and just become stewards of our urban environment. So um, I'm going to show you today some of the work that we do here at East River Park um, and some of the services that we provide to our planet and to residents here in this park as well. We're going to start right here in the compost yard and then we're going to take a walk. Um, we're going to take a walk through the park, along the promenade, along the waterfront, and we're going to end in the historic fire boathouse where you're going to get an exclusive look at our green roof. Uh, which has never been open to the public before, so it's very special. Um, and we're going to end with a final word from uh, Christina, our, our fearless leader and co-founder and executive director. Um, so we're going to get started. So we're in the compost yard and we are here with, behind me we have Peter. He is our, our compost operations manager. Uh, Hi everyone. Hi Peter, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for coming. So, Peter, tell us a little bit about just what goes on here in the East River Park compost yard. Sure. Um, well, come with me and I'll show you a little bit about how we compost food scraps here. So, we collect food scraps from the public in these trucks. We fill up these barrels every week, uh, mostly at the Union Square Green Market. And we bring them right here and we dump them out onto these wood chips. We blend them up. Uh, these are some food scraps right here. I'll give you a little preview of what we do normally. We tip these out. And we usually spend some time taking the plastic out. You can see there's some stuff that's not supposed to be in there. And then we blend it up. We use our bobcat over here and we mix those wood chips and the food scraps really well. And what happens is they end up getting really hot. I'll show you right here. Maybe you can see the steam, but this pile, I don't know. Can you get a close up, Antonio? Yeah. So that's going to go up to at least 140 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe higher. And that's all through the action of thermophilic bacteria. That's working hard to make your compost and keep it out of landfills, which is really why we do this, right? partly. And then the other reason, of course, is to make compost. And if you want to follow me over here to the sifter, I'll show you what the finished product looks like. It takes several months. We keep turning it with the bobcat. It goes through a curing phase right here. These are our curing piles. These piles are called windrows. 
They're long and narrow. And they go through this curing phase for several months. And eventually, they end up over here. And they go through this machine right here. This yellow and green machine. Um, I'll just give you a quick demo. So this, this is going to be kind of loud. But that helps us separate all these big chunks that haven't broken down from this good stuff that everybody wants, right? And that's uh, what you would put um, on your house plants or your garden plants or whatever. So that's what we're making out of what would otherwise be a waste product that would end up in a landfill and generate greenhouse gases. Awesome. Wow. Very cool. Thanks so much, Peter. So, um, so tell us what kind of items can be composted and what kind of items should be kept out of the food scraps bin? Right. Well, really anything, uh, that was ever alive can be composted, but in the interest of, uh, cleanliness, um, we like to minimize the amount of meat and dairy that goes in the bin. So if you're participating in our programs, Please keep those items to an absolute minimum. It just helps everything kind of stay a little uh, easier to manage. But really, anything can be composted and anything that was alive will break down um, naturally. And you can produce compost out of almost anything. Cool. We do have a question. Mm -hmm. What's the easiest way us at home to separate our piles? I don't know what you mean by piles but uh maybe putting it in the refrigerator yeah in the freezer okay yeah we like to um recommend people store their food scraps in the freezer it'll keep uh odors down and it won't attract any pests and it'll be really easy to transport to your drop-off um so if you're participating in our drop-off program that would be my recommendation cool great so um so for other viewers who are feeling in, like inspired by this, kind of hearing about um, the benefits of composting, um, what are some of the ways that they can really get involved in like supporting community composting um, operations like ours? Yeah, well, you can come out and volunteer. Uh, and if you want to follow me for a second, show you what happens uh, to some of the finished compost. Um, it ends up getting bagged. We have this whole bagging area here, and volunteers will come out here and spend uh, a morning filling bags or barrels, which will then go on the truck and will be brought out to community gardens. So it's really a uh, fun volunteer activity, especially if it's nice weather like this. Uh, you can come out and get some exercise, get your hands dirty. And of course, if you're not already, participate in our drop-off programs. We have locations uh, throughout Manhattan um, and we're expanding all the time adding new locations so check our website and see if there's one near you or maybe one of our partner uh, organizations is uh, in your area cool. great we also have if you live nearby we have some bins over here and I, we can walk over there and oh, take yeah. a look at them that's right we have a 24-7 uh, public food scrap drop-off there's no membership required. It's just open to the public all the time. Uh, we have a list of the acceptable items in case you forget. Uh, but if you're in the area or if you're just passing through, maybe commuting by bike, you can just drop off your scraps right here and they'll be composted just a few feet away. So this is, uh, take a look. Today's haul, if I keep this close and the flies don't get too crazy. And if you're interested in volunteering, we've got sign-up information right here. So if you want to stop by or just copy that URL, we have a volunteer newsletter that goes out every week and you'll get uh, updates with all the available opportunities. Cool. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. So here in the compost yard, we process on average about 5,000 pounds of food scraps every day. So Peter and his team here uh, are pretty busy, especially this time of year um, when there's a high demand for finished compost. So we're going to let Peter get back to work. Um, but thank you so much, Peter. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your walk. Take care. All right. So, um, so we're going to take
take a walk. We're going to go see what else is going on in East River Park today. Um, and while we're walking, I'll share a little bit about like the history of East River Park and some of the other things that are going on here. But we're also going to keep our eyes open for the red-tailed hawk. Uh, he loves to hang out here around the compost yard um, around this time of day. We actually had a pretty cool sighting of him uh, earlier this morning, just before we started. Uh, but he is kind of always around, just hanging out in these treetops or diving down for a rat or a pigeon. Um, so East River Park was actually, the idea was conceived in the 1930s by Robert Moses and opened for the public in 19. 19- um, 39 and it was designed really in tandem with the FDR Drive which is this highway back here um, so Robert Moses realized that with um, you know with the creation of this new highway going through the Lower East Side that residents would also need um, you know just access to a green space to go um, and to relax and to unwind and to just be outdoors and so that's um, how the idea of East River Park came about one notable feature is the amphitheater over here. So the amphitheater was um, opened in the 1940s and in the 50s it was actually the uh, original site of Shakespeare in the park. It then, you know, because of um, fun city budget cuts, it kind of fell into disrepair and wasn't really being utilized until after 9-11 when there were efforts to revitalize uh, downtown Manhattan and then some money was put into repairing it. Um, it had also previously been used for local high school graduations and uh, it was the site of the 1982 hip-hop classic movie Wild Styles final concert. Um, so just another fun fact about that space. Um, and so we are gonna, we're just gonna kind of walk through this way. As you can see, there's a lot of people that like to use this space still. A lot of people come out here and work out or do like group gatherings. Um, this is a really valuable space to the neighborhood residents. Um, in addition to the human residents, there's also a lot of um, plants and animals that call this place home. Um, one of my favorites, as I mentioned, the red-tailed hawk. Um, red-tailed hawks are, uh, really kind of their populations are really increasing um, in New York City there are pairs that live in each of the five boroughs now um, and a really cool super cool fact about these birds of prey is that they can actually spot a tiny little mouse on the ground from a hundred feet in the air and then they dive down at 120 miles per hour so super fast our guys in the compost yard including Peter actually have some um, really cool uh, stories. So if you're ever volunteering in the compost yard or you're dropping off your food scraps and you run into them, feel free to ask them about their, their hawk sightings. Um, and if you wanna learn more about red-tailed hawks in New York City, I recommend looking up the story of Pale Male, who has a uh, nest on the Upper East Side. It's really a New York legend. Uh, we could talk all day about that, but we're gonna <laughs> move on. So we have arrived here on the promenade. Um, this is a gorgeous place for a stroll. If you live nearby or even if you don't and you're just looking for an opportunity to get out of your house, get out of your apartment um, and take a walk in New York City and just like take a break from the busyness of our everyday lives, this is a really great space because you can walk along the promenade and on one side we have all of these gorgeous native plants that have been planted, most of them, a lot of them by our stewardship team. Um, and then on the other side we have the waterfront. So we have the East River right here we have views of the water we have views of the Williamsburg Bridge and we have uh, views of the Brooklyn skyline so it's just really nice to kind of come out here and sit out here um, I also want to show you I'm gonna kind of um, go off script a little bit and we're gonna um, we're gonna just take a peek right over here we're gonna kind of scurry around this little patch and I want to show you these gorgeous bluebells so these bluebells have just recently bloomed. They just popped up and, and bloomed. And as you can see, there's just so many of them kind of cascading along this walkway. Um, our stewardship team actually planted over 10,000 uh, bluebell bulbs um, over the period of two years. Bluebell bulbs, try saying that three times fast. Um, okay, so back to the East River. 
So the East River is really cool because it's actually a saltwater tidal estuary, which means it's a very special type of environment where fresh water meets salt water from the ocean. Um, and we call that type of water, that kind of mixed water, we call it brackish water. Um, it's a special type of habitat because the salinity can vary uh, day by day depending on the tides, depending on weather and other factors. So any animal that lives in there has to be kind of uniquely adapted to regulate their own salinity levels. So we have lots of striped bass here. We have oyster toadfish. We have blue crabs. We even have seahorses, um, which are super amazing. I only recently learned that there are seahorses in the East River. I thought that was a pretty cool fact. Um, and so here at the Ecology Center, we believe that really getting kind of up close and personal with the environment is really the best way to learn about it and to understand it. And when we learn and understand something, we're more likely to take better care of it and to really be a steward for it. So we actually offer, um, we actually offer free public fishing clinics. We have, our, we have some coming up in June. You can learn more on our website about that. So you can come out, you can fish with us. We provide the, we provide the rod, the bait tackle, um, and the instructions and the expertise. And you can learn about the ecology of the East River, but also how to enjoy it safely. So I highly recommend checking those out if you're interested. All right. led this team um, of volunteers to kind of plant all these beautiful native species. So we're going to stop and we're going to chat with Melinda for a moment. Hey Melinda, hey. you got some time to chat with us? Yes, I do. All right. Um, so tell us, what are you and your volunteers doing out here today? We're uh, weeding out mugwort, uh, bindweed, mugwort, bindweed, um, thistles creeping thistles, um, and a variety of other weeds that uh, pop up in East River Park. Um, and we basically are maintaining the planting beds. So cool. that's, what, that's what we do with the volunteers. Uh, Great. We, we sometimes put in plants, um, but this year we haven't been doing that. We've just been maintaining the planting beds that we do for the most part. Melinda, could you show us maybe one or two of your favorite plants that are out here and tell us a little bit more about it? Well, some of my favorites aren't really in bloom right now because I like the uh, sleepiest, uh, the milkweeds, and, um, but I do like a number of uh, these plants. Uh, these are red choke cherries that are in bloom right now. Um, these are, are good wildlife plants. The birds use the berries. Um, they're moderate value. The um, Lindera, the spice shrub over here is a favorite. Um, this has high wildlife value. This is a uh, Lindera um, benzone. It smells really good and the birds use that. We also have um, beach plums over here, which is, um, these are uh, the beach plums are, are native. These were all native to the Northwest. Um, or no, northeast, I'm sorry. Um, so the beach plums are native to the northeast and they generally get these white flowers on them in the spring, which is how you can identify the shrub. Um, later on in the summer, the, the plants generally get the beach plums usually around Labor Day, uh, September, um, late August, September. But by then you won't really be able to see the plums very well because they'll be covered by the leaves. So a good way to find out where they are is to um, notice them in the spring when the flat white flowers are out. Um, Great, thank you for showing those, Melinda. Yeah. So tell you, I heard you mention you know native species. So for some of our viewers who don't know what that means, could you tell us a little bit more okay. about the about what a native species yeah. means? A native species basically is a plant that's been growing for hundreds or thousands of years in a particular ecosystem. So in the U.S., it would be plants that were here perhaps before the um, uh, European settlers came in, and uh, we have many different types of plants here in um, East River Park that we've been putting. Well, thank you for that. And so 
for people who are kind of looking and just being like, wow, this is gorgeous and this is amazing and they want to get involved or support, um, you know, kind of stewarding our environment with like these species, what are some of the things that they can do? Um, well, if they want to do stewardship in East River Park, all they have to do is show up um, Tuesday to Saturday at 9.30 in the morning at the Fireboat House and we'll take them out and uh, show them which plants to weed out. We do a lot of hand pulling here. We don't have um, mechanical tools. We leave that to parks more, so um, we're doing hand weeding. And um, we'll also, if they want to put in uh, native plants, they should research um, their area, what, what is a native plant in the northeastern area that they might be living, and they could put them into their their gardens or their community gardens, um, and they can also research which birds might use them, which uh, which butterflies might use them. There's a lot of a lot of plants that uh, are really useful. Great, so. thank you so much, Melinda. We'll let you get back to okay, work. Thank you. Um, so Melinda works out here with volunteers. We've had uh, a lot of volunteers, a lot of regular, recurring volunteers who have. Um, who have been coming out since the pandemic started. A lot of people find that it's a great way to kind of just get out of their apartments, to um, to just get outdoors. And so Jackie is one of our ongoing, uh, recurring uh, volunteers who has spent a lot of time out here working with Melinda. Jackie, how long have you been volunteering with us? 10 months, I think. 10 months, wow. Yeah. Um, and why did you start volunteering out here with us? I live in the neighborhood, so I come to a park all the time. I was trying to tell I should do something about this park. So I saw the sign that you guys are needing volunteers. So I try to volunteer as much as I can. Great. Well, thank you, Jackie. You're We're welcome. really glad to have you. We'll let you get back to work. Thank I know you. Melinda uh, is working you pretty hard, thank so <laughs> we'll get back to work. Thank you so much. Um, so Jackie's just one of our many volunteers. Like I said, a lot of people really take, especially local residents, really take pride in this in this park as being their space, their respite from just the busyness of daily life. Um, and through the pandemic, it's been a great opportunity for people to just get outdoors, uh, kind of move their bodies, and and also feel productive and like they're contributing to something. And so we really, really are grateful for all of our volunteers who come with us. All right. So we are going to walk over to the boathouse. Um, this is the historic fire boathouse over here and it is exactly like its name implies. It was um, originally housed the New York City Fire Department's Marine Company 6. So their boats would dock here and it kind of housed the uh, marine firefighters. Um, and then it was decommissioned as part of a as part of a, a plan to de-industrialize the city's waterfront. And so it was closed down, I believe in the early 90s. And then in 1998, the um, Ecology Center moved in. And it's been a really great opportunity for us because, you know, when we do these environmental stewardship programs, having like access to an outdoor space, having access to a park and having access to the waterfront uh, really just enhances the quality of our programs and the quality of the experiences for participants. So we have been here for um, 20, 23 years. Um, a lot of people have been asking, so because of Esker, you know, this project to uh, build coastal resiliency, um, you know, the park is going to be kind of demolished and rebuilt. A lot of people are asking, what does that mean for the future of the boathouse? Is the fire boathouse going to be uh, torn down? And it will not be, it will be preserved. So if you're worried about this big historic building, it will still be standing. Um, all right. So um, one really important thing that I promised I would show you today is our green roof. So we do have some signage out here. Many people have kind of just walked by and seen this sign, but I've never actually got to see the, uh, the fire boathouse. Uh, fire boathouse green roof. Um, it's never been open to the public. It's a little bit of a tricky process to get to it. You got to climb up a ladder through a dark tunnel. And so um, I'm not going to climb up there today, but one of our other staff members, uh, Renee, is up there right now and we're going to have her join and, and show you. So if Renee, if you're watching, give, we'll give her a second. We'll just 
hang tight. All right, is Renee with us? Hi. 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 Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to flip the camera so you can actually see the green roof. Um, if I go over to the edge, we can wave down to um, a collection of sedum primarily. Uh, sedum is great for green roots because it has low, um, low shallow roots. Um, a lot of times green roofs have just like a small layer of like a soil or a soil type medium um, that covers the roof kind of in a carpet. Um, there's, there are different kinds of technologies that folks use to create a green roof. Um, you can kind of see here, it's like a carpet and you can see the different layers of, um, of the shallow soil and the rock leaves. Um, see the different kinds of sedum. So you've got these different like green flowery ones. You've got these like, like pink little, they almost look like succulents. And then we've got some like mosses that are growing too. And then even some of these, uh, these plants start to flower. And greeners are really great because they uh, absorb stormwater, or absorb rainwater prevented from over inundating our stormwater system. Uh, they also keep buildings really cool. Um, uh, they keep buildings maybe about like 30% cooler. And uh, they also provide habitat for birds and bees and um, all the beneficial pollinators that are out there too. So in the summertime, we see the rooftop kind of vibrating a bit um, with pollinators. Um, the other great thing, you get a great view. You already saw the Williamsburg Bridge, but now we're seeing it from up top. And I think with that, I will pass it back over to Jennifer. All right, thank you so much, Renee. Thank you so much, Renee. Thanks for being up there. All right, all right. So we saw the green roof. We saw, we saw the beautiful flower beds with Melinda. We saw the waterfront, we saw the compost yard. And so before we wrap up, we're going to just, we're gonna chat, as I said, our co-founder and executive director and hear a little bit um, from her about the work that the Ecology Center is doing um, and the future of the Ecology Center too. Hi, Christina. Hi, Jennifer, I hope you had fun. Oh, um, showing off East River Park. Well, thank you for joining us today. My name is Christina Dats Romero, and I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Lower East Side Ecology Center. Thank you for joining us to explore this wonderful waterfront park. I hope whether you are familiar with our organization or just hear about us for the first time that you learn something about this very special place in our hearts. Um, Jane Walk is really a celebration of the power of individuals shaping their communities. And today, I hope we showed you how when community comes together and working for a more sustainable future, what can happen. Uh, our programs wouldn't be possible without the thousands of participants and the hundreds of volunteers that participate in our programs. And one of the, the heart of our programs here in East River Park is composting. Composting lets people be part of the climate solution. In, uh, by ensuring that the food scraps are separated and then turned into rich soil amendment instead of rotting away in some landfill where they would contribute to uh, where they would contribute methane gas and contribute to a climate crisis our community here has seen the effects of uh, climate crisis firsthand in 2012 when superstorm sandy hit new york city the waters came all the way, flooded this park all the way uh, across the FDR and got into the residential areas abutting this park. After the flood waters receded, we got busy rebuilding the park. We used compost, of course, 
to rejuvenate our depleted soils. And then we planted over 5,000 native shrubs and perennials to really create an, uh, an ecosystem that's resilient and that could withstand future flooding by really picking up plants that would be salt tolerant. Um, and what you've seen, uh, what you witnessed today is the results of this work. Um, with the imminent start of construction to create much needed flood protection for our community, we want to make sure that this park stays resilient and vibrant and we need your help. Please consider to participate, contribute or volunteer with our organization. A great way to start is to visit our website lesecologycenter.org and to subscribe to our newsletter uh, so you know what we're up to and so you can participate in all of our wonderful programs and we really hope that you will join us in this magnificent part soon because it is absolutely precious. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, and on that note, we're going to wrap up. Do we have any final questions? Any questions from the audience, from the audience for Christina or for me about anything that we saw? So if you have any questions, you can just uh, type it in the chat box. And like Christina said, you can visit our website. You can learn more about what's going on. You can sign up for one of our fishing clinics in June. You can volunteer in the compost yard. You can volunteer with Melinda. Um, or you can donate to support our programs. Because we are a nonprofit, and we do rely on um, generous on generous support um, from viewers like you. <laughs> like you, yes. Um, so on... <laughs> So on that note, we're going to say goodbye. Feel free to contact us if you have any additional questions um, about how to get involved that we didn't cover here. Thanks so much for, for watching and for joining us today. <laughs>